Hinomoto was a land once dominated by humans for centuries, but after the sudden appearance of the all-powerful beings named Kishin and their demon troops called Oni, everything fell apart. The strongest kingdoms perished and became wastelands as the Kishin conquered everything and set the stage for a new Oni-dominated era. However, some humans have continued to fight against the Kishin's tyranny under the name Bands of Bushi. Now, 156 years later, humans worship and pray to Kishin, as if they're gods and every little kid dreams of becoming a minor for their Oni lords as it is considered the highest honor in society. In the small town of Tatsuyama, Musashi is the star student in the minor training school, standing out from the rest with his giant and flashy pickaxe. He gets praised by his peers to no end, but he hides his true feelings with gritted teeth. In history class, they're taught that the Bushi were a line of evil humans that oppressed the people of Hinomoto, especially the agricultural and working classes, up until 150 years ago, when the generous Oni came and freed them from the reign of terror. However, Musashi knows better than to believe in this propaganda because he knows the truth. You see, his childhood friend was a Bushi and his father, Jizai Kanmaki, had shown them old scrolls and taught them how the Bushi were the only ones to fight against the Oni when they attacked humanity and still do in hopes of someday granting humans real freedom. He made a promise with his friend, Kojiro, to fight the Oni together and become the strongest Bushi band ever. He remembers those days fondly while zoning out in class. The teacher reminds them that their graduation and entrance ceremony to the mines is the next day and makes them recite their daily chant. As the students enthusiastically chant their dreams to become miners, Musashi tries to gather the courage to say out loud that he wants to become a Bushi, but ultimately fails. After class, Musashi visits Kojiro in his small, isolated house in the woods to discuss something serious. He shares that he has no intention of becoming a miner. He revisits their childhood promise and urges Kojiro to leave town with him, revealing his pickaxe actually has a katana blade, and he has been training to fight for the past five years while digging in school. However, Kojiro refuses to go because he knows better than anyone how badly people discriminate against them just for being bushy, making him believe his father would just tell him lies about their ancestors being heroes to make him feel good. Moreover, he doesn't take Musashi's claims of becoming a bushy seriously because he doesn't even have the guts to admit it to others, so he sternly tells him to drop his nonsense. Agitated, Musashi storms off to prove his dedication. Kojiro watches his friend leave and hopes he lives a normal life as a minor. He recalls his time back in school when they learned about the law that mandates all bushy to carry their katana at all times for identification purposes, with all of his other classmates snickering at him as his blade sticks out like a sore thumb. His position in society only allows him to be a garbage cleaner who picks up people's trash as they shout insults at him. He could never wish for Musashi to have this same fate. He finds a sealed package on the floor that Musashi must have dropped and opens it to see a thick book filled with training notes, surprising him. The next day, the townspeople give Musashi and his classmates an extravagant send-off as they march toward the mines, but all Musashi can hear are Kojiro's harsh words from yesterday. After going through the Oni gate, they climb a bunch of stairs until reaching another gate beyond which their Oni masters wait. Before entering, all their possessions, including Musashi's pickaxe katana, are taken from them for purification. Everyone's so excited that they almost pee their pants, but what they see once the gates open makes them wet themselves out of fear. They're greeted by the sight of a giant cat demon with two tails devouring one of the poor miners. The people who escorted them completely change their tone and order them to dig up stones for their Oni masters until they die. All the newbies are petrified after realizing they've been lied to their entire lives to end up on this hell on earth, but Musashi comes forward and reveals he'd been preparing to fight these monsters his entire life, but remembers he doesn't have his katana. One of the cat monsters transforms into an even more vicious form and attacks him, but he dodges and grabs a pickaxe from the ground. His friends beg him to stop fighting because he doesn't stand a chance against the Oni, but he gets back up and announces for the first that he is a bushy. He gets beat up a lot by the oversized cat, during which he contemplates why he hid his real dream for such a long time. He is ashamed to admit to himself that he did it because he wanted to fit in and get along with the others, but in the process, he lost his dear friend Kojiro. Eventually, he gets bloodied up and gets lifted by the Oni with a single finger. Just when he is about to be killed, Kojiro assaults the Oni with his motorbike, Sari Ketatsuki. He apologizes for accusing Musashi of not being serious and is glad to find out his father was right about the Oni's true nature all along. They fight the Oni side by side, with Musashi using a sword-drawing technique called the Thousand Vortex Shredder for his notes to kill his first Oni. While they defeat one Oni after another, Musashi reveals his true motive for wanting them to be a bushy band together is that it would be no fun to go on any adventures and fight battles without his friend by his side. Touched by his words, Kojiro accepts his proposal to form a band together. 
Suddenly, an ominous red light shines from the sky, signaling the arrival of a Kishin, the strongest of all Oni. Musashi mounts the Kiritsuki so Kojiro can quickly take them to the light while he slices and dices Onis. While driving, Kojiro confesses that he doesn't really care about becoming a bushy and has lost the hunger to fight over the years. However, Musashi isn't worried because he knows his desire will return once he gets into action. The Kishin enters their field of view and honestly, it looks very underwhelming. Oh no, it's the giant red pill. Turn away if you don't want to become an insul. Musashi one-shots it with a swing of his katana. Well, that was easy. But wait, the Kishin revives itself by joining its two separated parts back. Worshippers approach it with a cart full of gold bars as offerings which it eats like a can of Pringles. After eating, it transforms into a much larger and fearsome Kishin called the Ingoku Tengu. The worshippers get on their knees and rejoice over seeing the Kishin in its true form for the first time in five years. Kojiro decides it's futile to try and fight it, and they should escape instead, but Musashi is out cold. The Kishin picks Kojiro up by his sword, and the miners tell them to let go of it because the monster eats swords. However, he refuses to let go despite being dragged around and roughed up by the Kishin. He remembers his childhood when he had grown to hate the sword and what it represents, and tries to throw it away. However, his father reminded him that the Oni were the bad guys and that he is part of a proud and courageous bloodline that fights for humanity's rightful place in the world. Now that he finally accepts his dad's words as the truth, he can't let go of the sword. He resists for the longest time, but the Kishin finally pins him down on the ground, yanks the sword away from him, and swallows it. Musashi jumps into action and climbs atop the Kishin's giant stomach. Maybe it should consider a healthier diet of knives and broccoli. Musashi furiously strikes its stomach repeatedly, until he makes a hole that he falls into as the Kishin topples over in pain. Kojiro worries that his friend died, but he eventually rises from the depths with the sword and returns it to Kojiro, saying he knows how much it means to him. Feeling pride for his bushy bloodline, he gets the willpower to fight and enthusiastically tells Musashi they should become the strongest bushy band ever. Suddenly, a couple of worshippers stationed on a watchtower announce the arrival of a bushy band. They witness a giant moving building advancing toward the Kishin, destroying everything in its path, including the Kishin's barrier. Several bushy warriors on Kitatsuki burst out from the building and make an even bigger hole in its stomach. They get into a line formation in front of the Kishin and use their swords to fly. While witnessing bushy might with awe, the band captain, Naotora Takeda, approaches Musashi and Kojiro and tells them to scram because it's too dangerous. However, they argue that they are bushy too, who opened up the hole in the Kishin's belly. Take your laughs at that statement because opening up its belly does nothing to it. Sure enough, the Kishin heals itself like it did last time and creates a firestorm around it. Kojiro realizes how above their leave this demon is and urges Musashi to retreat, but Mushashi holds his ground, unable to let go of what was supposed to be their first achievement as a bushy dew band. He storms past the flames, slays one of the cat demons in the way, and faces the Kishin. However, no matter how hard he tries, the Kishin just mends itself instantly. A glowing green whip circles around him and pulls him up to the bushy camp. He tries to defy them, but Captain Takeda brings him to reality, showing how an entire band is taking to kill one Kishin, because superficial attacks are futile against it. If Musashi fights alone, he'll just be giving up his life and never defeat it. Our stupid Musashi still doesn't stay put and breaks out of his binds to attack on his own. Meanwhile, Kojiro stays frozen in place, unable to do anything, when he overhears the Bushi talking about the attack they're setting up to hit the Kishin's core horn. He knows he can't just sit around and suck his thumb while his friends risks his life, so he decides to find out what the core horn is. Musashi runs straight into the attack zone with a plan to strike the Kishin repeatedly in one spot to defeat it. The crane wing's sky formation to hit the core misses because he causes it to fall over. He persists, but a feeling of dread haunts him as the captain's words ring in his ears. However, Kojiro's voice blares from the ground, telling Musashi to attack the big core horn in its navel as it is its weak spot. Musashi boldly strikes it, but his katana snaps like a twig when it makes contact. Captain Takeda pushes him aside and tells him to stay back for like the hundredth time. He slices the horn in one swoop of his glowing sword, defeating the Kishin while his band members cheer him on. The Kishin disintegrates and all the bushy surround it, raising their swords in sync as a bright white glow surrounds them. Takta explains that they are absorbing the energy of the fallen Kishin. The worn down and hopeless miners fervently thank the band for saving them from the terrible Oni. Captain Takeda addresses the crowd, vowing to slay all of the Kishin and make the world safe for humanity again. One of the captured worshippers furiously yells out that their feudal resistance has been going on for over 150 years, and the only thing it's done is harm civilians who get caught up in the violent conflict. 
The captain says to the worshippers that he's heard those statements over and over while growing up, but he chooses fighting back for freedom over living in a false stability that forces people to live their lives around the Oni's wishes. This is the bushy dream that has been passed over generations, making them stronger and stronger. He proclaims that this will be the generation that emerges victorious over the Oni. While everyone celebrates, Musashi is still filled with frustration and bitterness over having their first prize stolen. The captain approaches him and Kojiro and lightheartedly apologizes for taking the rug out from under them, which Kojiro immediately accepts. After seeing everyone happy, Musashi decides to keep a lid on his feeling and walks away without saying anything. The captain and his posse follow him, poking fun at him for being a sore loser. He snaps and lets all his frustrations out for everyone to hear. Captain Takeda acknowledges his potential and gives him a big crystal as a consolation prize for stealing his thunder. Later, Kojiro and Musashi inspect the crystal closely to see it actually works like a telescope. Kojiro vaguely recalls seeing the crystal somewhere before and takes out his father's scroll to see one of the men in the illustration holding something closely resembling the crystal. Moreover, Musashi notices the pattern inside the kaleidoscope closely resembles the large red thing in the scroll's center, which Kojiro points out is supposed to be an oni. This makes Musashi realize that Captain Takeda gave them this as a tool to find oni. They read the contents of the scroll to find out that there are over a hundred Kishin in Hinomoto, the names of which are listed in the scroll, including the Ngoku Tenga they defeated. Further, the scroll prophesizes that when the Bushi defeat all the Kishin, Hinomoto's land will be unified. There will be one responsible for this victory and union called the Great Unifier, who will become the new king of Hinomoto. Pumped after reading, Musashi goes up to the Takeda band to tell Captain Takeda he will be the one to unite the land, to which the captain says he won't be able to do it by himself. Musashi points out that they haven't been able to do it either, and they've had 150 years to try. If no one can do it, Musashi's going to be the one to succeed. Takeda likes his confidence and wishes him luck. The next day, he and Kojiro decide to leave their town to look for their next kitchen. Seeing the peak of Tatsuyama seem so small from afar, Musashi thinks of how he probably would have spent his whole life mining for the Oni if Kojiro and his dad never taught him swordsmanship. The two take budget traveling to the extreme by carrying very little food supplies and a straw mat as a bed. The novelty of adventuring with a best friend wears off within a week, and they start quarreling over the littlest things. Musashi blames Kojiro for packing so few things, to which he says maybe he shouldn't have left all the packing responsibility upon him. He calls Musashi sheltered and shows off the power of self-sufficiency he gained after he had to live on his own once his father died by expertly catching fish. Musashi storms off muttering to himself that he'll prove how good he is fishing real soon. After he leaves, Kojiro regrets squabbling over such a petty thing and admits to himself that Musashi is more skilled at fighting. Suddenly, he feels somebody's presence behind him and turns back to see a shadowed figure of a girl behind him. Meanwhile, Musashi wastes a lot of time being unsuccessful at fishing and also feels bad for fighting over food. He walks over to Kojiro's fishing spot to make amends, but he isn't where he left him. He finds him some distance away, lying on the ground. He panics and checks on his friend to see him injured with a sword wound in his face. Before Kojiro can warn him, a green-haired girl named Sugui appears behind Musashi, pins him to the ground and demands he gives her all their valuables, including the Kaitetsuki. Wouldn't that be nice? Instead, Musashi gets out of her pin and fights her with ease, finding her light and weak, albeit swift and slippery. Once she's pushed to a disadvantage, she busts out a pair of scary-looking weapons, but a horn blows in the distance, making her stop. She panics that it's already past noon and doesn't want to make her lord mad, so she loots their Kitetsuki and makes a dash for it. Baffled, the two boys follow her to get their only viable mode of transportation back. She arrives at Kosamitaban's fortress, where she frantically apologizes to her lord, Captain Hideo Kosamita, for being late but informs him that she successfully stole the Kedetsuki, just as he instructed. Hearing this, Kosamita gives her a warm smile and hugs her, telling her she is doing her part as a bushi to reunite the land. Shortly after, Musashi and Kojiro arrive at the fortress entrance and realize they'll be making contact with yet another bushi band. They wander around the endless halls looking for their mount when Sugumi appears around the corner and offers to show them their Kedetsuki, claiming she only meant to borrow it. She chirpily tells them to follow her, which seems very suspicious right off the bat. While following her, they get a better look inside the fortress and are amazed to see a lively town packed inside. Sugun explains that Kishin pop up all over Hinomoto, and the bushy bands must always be well equipped to fight them. Hence, bushy band fortresses can travel and also contain within them a large community of farmers, blacksmiths, medics, and everything else you can think of for a continuous supply of all necessary resources. 
The families who live in these fortresses have been doing so for hundreds of years, so bushy bands are like large families that fight together. While showing them around, they run into a couple of kids who want to spar with Tsubui, but she's too tired to, so Kojiro takes her place. While he plays with them, Musashi goes on about how the bushy life seems even nicer than he thought and how he didn't expect to see so many happy families, but Tsubhumi's sad face tells a different story. She shares that even though everybody in the band acts like a big family, she doesn't have any blood relatives here. She had an older sister Tsubame who she looked up to, but one day she was killed, leaving Tsubhumi alone. Musashi empathizes with her, revealing that he is also alone. Later, Captain Kosameda rolls out a huge feast just to greet the two of them and states that he looks forward to an alliance with them. He says he took a look at their kit at Suki, and upon seeing how high-end it is, realized they must be elite bushy men who've killed many a Kishin. The two bashfully laugh, not sure what to say. The captain proposes that they fight alongside his band to get rid of the many stray Onis in the area. That way, they can minimize casualties and split the Kitetsu. Musashi asks what Kitetsu is and Kojiro seems puzzled as well. After finding out they don't know what Kitetsu is, he deems them useless and orders Sugiui to tie them up. She draws her twin blades from which she unleashes glowing green whips to capture them and looks at them with haunted eyes while saying sorry. The captain tells his men to lock them up in a cell and look through their belongings because they might have other Kitetsu hidden somewhere, considering their fine Kitetsuki. Sugumi is made to apologize because she failed in her mission to bring powerful Bushi for him to use. He calls her a useless and stupid daughter. The band is at the edge of ruin because they're running short of fighters in Kitetsu after many successive fights with Onis. He intends to defend the land he was left behind by Lord Takugawa at all costs, even considering ordering a total mobilization the next time there's an Oni attack. Sugumi tries to protest because most of the adult civilians in the town are women and the elderly, but he forces her to shut up. Scared out of her wits, she returns to her submissive state and asks her lord what she should do next. He instantly changes his demeanor from hostile to warm and tells her he'll always be there with her because she's useless without him so she just needs to do what he tells her to. Wow, this is super, super toxic. Later, Tsugumi approaches the locked up boys and asks if they have any Kitetsu they're hiding. Realizing they really don't know what it means, she explains that Kitetsu is the white glowing iron dust that spills out of a defeated Kishin, which the Bushi used to gain power and fight the Kishin. The band urgently requires a lot of it because there's a herd of dangerous Kodama Oni fast approaching the castle. Musashi notices her trembling hands and urges her to share whatever she's thinking. She realizes she's been bottling up a lot inside her, like how she opposes the total mobilization decision and hates the idea of everybody dying. She starts crying and yells at Musashi to stop getting into her head before running away. Later that night, the two escape thanks to Kojiro's amazing aiming skills, which lets him obtain the key to unlock their cell. They find their Kitetsuki, but hear a deep rumbling sound in the distance, signaling some bad news is coming toward the castle fast. At the same time inside the castle, Lord Kosameta hears news of an incoming wave of Oni and orders Tsugui to start the total mobilization. She decides to keep her silence no longer and blatantly states that she is against this decision. Furious, Kosameta is about to punch her, but stops himself and chooses another manipulation tactic. He starts crying to express his disappointment that the orphan he treated as his own daughter all these years has turned against him, and now that she's useless, he threatens to throw her off the castle. While making her hang over the edge of the railing, he tells her she's no longer a member of the band, and that she has to live the rest of her life in the wilderness alone. Terrified of being alone, she agrees to do as he says as long as he doesn't abandon her. She goes to sit in front of the giant picture of her, Subayim and the Lord. She thinks of the many times Kosameta treated Subame, just the way he treats her now, and she finally understands how much it must have affected her confidence and well-being. She tells her sister that she's decided to defy the Lord in order to protect the townsfolk. At that moment, Misashi and Kojiro break down the wall of the painting by riding their Kitetsuki through it. They give her a much-needed pep talk, after which she offers to show them their weapons if they help her with something in return. After giving them their weapons, they think of a plan to get the townspeople to safety. Meanwhile, Lord Kosameta addresses the civilians to inform them of the huge swarm of Kodama Oni barreling toward the castle and rallies them to join the battle. However, these people who have never seen the bee in battle are reasonably concerned and try to escape, but their way is blocked by armed soldiers. Shigumi grabs everyone's attention by throwing some smoke bombs. She states that the Bushi's duty is to defend its people first and foremost and that sending so many non-combatants to the field is unwise anyway because it'll only lead to casualties of unrecoverable magnitude. Instead, they should take cover until the swarm passes and then seek Lord Takugawa's help. In reality, she's only doing this to divert the Lord's attention to buy time for everyone to escape. 
While she delivers her speech, Musashi and Kojiro use the smoke as a cover to quickly knock the guards out. After that, nobody can stop the townsfolk from escaping, but to their surprise, nobody makes a move. Sugumi realizes they're all still scared of the Lord, just like she was this whole time. She believes the only way to shake them out of their fear is to fight and defeat him. However, he tackles her to the ground almost as soon as the fight starts because he's the one who taught her after all. He keeps kicking her while she's on the ground while lecturing her and the others about how weak and helpless they are without him. He picks her up to order her to do as he says and punches her, but she defiantly spits blood on his face. She boldly says she won't listen to him anymore and activates her twin blades to fight him again. She eventually binds him with her green rope, after which the civilians narrowly escape from the fortress before the Oni Swarm arrives. Well, everyone escapes except for Lord Kosameda and Sugumi. She knows even if she runs now, she won't make it in time to survive. She wonders if her sister will think she did the right thing when she meets her in heaven, but she admits to herself that she wishes she could live a little longer. She hears Musashi's voice close by and opens her eyes to see him extend his hand to her from the Kaitetsuki. She grabs his hand and gets on the bike to make a grand escape. The fortress town is in complete ruins in the aftermath of the Oni mob, but the people still look happier than they did under the Lord's rule all thanks to Sugumi's radiating positivity. So it comes as a complete shock when an old woman approaches Musashi and Kojiro to ask them to kick her out of the fortress. She elaborates that after being betrayed by all his people, Lord Kosameta spiraled into madness, and he's even more fixated on Sugumi than ever. If she ends up with him again, she'll fall for his manipulation tactics again. However, the thought of leaving behind her beloved fortress and people brings her to tears. Ultimately though, she decides to leave the town and asks to join the boys as a band member. Of course, they both agree. The next day, they leave with their new member. Sugumi receives a heartwarming farewell from the town folk, who run behind their Kitetsuki with dandelions and wish her the best. Their next stop is straight ahead, where a blue kitchen should be according to the kaleidoscopic crystal. They set up a camp for the day after covering some distance. While everyone's sleeping, an oni emerges from a burrowing hole and takes off the Kojiro's sword. Musashi follows it with a metal staff and catches up with it to strike its horn. However, the staff splits in half. The oni leads him to an open landscape filled with swords. Musashi doesn't know what to make of it when a cloaked man tells him that he can borrow one of the beautiful swords to defeat the oni. Seeing it eat Kojiro's swords forces him into action, and he grabs one of the swords. Upon lifting it, he is enveloped by pure energy, and his body gets pierced with spikes. Feeling like his arm is on fire, he uses this new feeling of power to disintegrate the One. He is stunned by the sheer might of the sword, and Shido tells him he just used a Ketetsu blade. The iron dust that spilt from the Oni gets absorbed by the blade just like it did for the Takeda band, but it suddenly breaks. He profusely apologizes to Shiro, but he says he didn't need it anyway because it was a crap sword. However, he notes how Musashi drew more power than expected from it and wonders if he's the one he's been looking for. At that moment, a woman comes in and calls him out for getting up to his sword shenanigans again, which causes him to go on a nerdy rambling about the intricacies of each beautiful sword. She apologizes on her master's behalf for his weirdness, and the two make their leave. Musashi asks them who they are, to which they claim they are nameless dogs for hire. Kojiro and Sugumi arrive at the scene to help Musashi. He answers to their calls and intends to introduce them to the two mysterious people, but they've disappeared along with all the swords by the time his band members arrive. He recounts the events to them, but they find it hard to believe and ask if he's sure he wasn't dreaming. He's sure it was all real and says he can't wait to use a Ketetsu blade again, even though he doesn't really know what it is. Sugumi shows them her twin blades and says they're made of Ketetsu, the only material which allows a wielder to cut through an Oni's horn. Fascinated, Musashi and Kojiro expect this material and such weapons to be super rare and get excited to go on a quest to obtain some, but Sugumi tells them to just buy one. She elaborates that whenever a kitchen shows up, a bunch of bushy bands follow too. Naturally, merchants take advantage of this and come to such places as well to sell a variety of goods including Kitetsu weapons. She leads them to one such market so that they can buy their first Kitetsu blades before starting their Oni hunting missions. Musashi marvels at the sight of such a bustling market full of bushes. All goods are sold off to the highest bidder at auctions and business takes place using Kitetsu and fixed units called Sen as currency. Since Kitetsu blades are the biggest attractions, they're saved for auctioning last. In the meantime, they go to a ramen shop to fill their stomachs. While eating, they're approached by an older drunk man who asks them what band they're in, which makes them realize they haven't decided on a name yet. This highly amuses the guy because he goes off laughing as if he just saw someone sit on a whoopee cushion on a first date. 
Sugim explains that choosing who will be the captain among them is very important because it makes it easier to understand whose orders band members are supposed to listen to, and the band is conventionally named after the captain's family name. Without a moment's hesitation, Musashi suggests Kojiro should be the captain, explaining he doesn't have a family name anyway, and that as long as they share the same dream, it doesn't matter. That settles the matter quicker and neater than anyone would expect, and their band acquires the name Kanemaki Band. The time for the Kitetsu Blade auction arrives, and an excited crowd gathers in no time. First up, there are 25 swords up for auction by the Rizoji Band. Musashi wonders which one he should keep his eyes on. The head of Rizoji Band's smiths, Osufu Mitsuru, answers that he doesn't have to think so hard and should buy whichever one he falls in love with at first sight, because Ibushi and their weapon are strongly drawn to each other. After finding out he's never bought a Ketetsu blade, she proclaims that it's a big day for him because choosing a blade is a rite of passage for the bushes. After the beat of a drum, interested bushes are made to stand in front of the blade that they want. Musashi picks a black and red sword named Enma's Udachi, probably because it matches his outfit. Kojiro isn't as decisive and looks around for a while until he chooses a katana called Vorpal Cherry Blossoms because he notices nobody's paying attention to it and relates to it. Somebody give this guy a hug. Osafune tells them they both have a good eye and to go ahead and hold their swords. Musashi goes first and is flooded with a strange feeling. Osafune and Sugume explain that he's going through the sword's trial which decides if he's worthy enough of a bushy to wield the blade. Only after a person passes it can they use the blade. Kojiro grabs his katana's hilt to feel his pulse quicken immediately and feel something strong course through his veins. He basically experiences a near-death experience while his life flashes before his eyes, but once it's over, the sword lights up with a blue aura and wings of glowing stone erupt from his body. This officially makes him the owner of the Kitetsu blade. He sees other bushy men glowing with different colors. Osafune explains that all bushes have colored souls and the minerals in the blades glow to match their color. Depending on the color of which there are five, a Kaitesta blade has different powers. Kojiro's blue is fairly common, and according to Osafune, each band should have at least one red. Musashi is still floating in the air in the midst of the trial. Inside his consciousness, he is back in his hometown Tatsuyama, which seems to be drenched in a heavily sinister atmosphere. The noise of angry Oni worshippers rings in his ears, and his eyes focus to realize he's back in the past when he saw Kojiro's father Jizai in his final moments before he's executed. Jizai looks back at young Musashi and says something to him that he can't hear. He desperately tries to understand his words, but is pulled out of the memory and finds a stranger woman standing in front of him. She also says something to him that he can't hear and then hugs him. He lets his guard down because she feels warm and comforting, but she suddenly transforms into a giant muscular form and pulls on his arms, yelling that she doesn't need him. He finally returns to the real world, where an ominous black aura surrounds him and black spikes erupt from all over his body. Osafune recognizes the black aura from legends and worries that he is forsaken. Musashi tries with other swords, but he gets surrounded by the same black aura and fails all their trials. Once he's about to try his seventh sword, Osafune finally tells him the bad news. She explains that those with black, burnt-out souls are forsaken and rejected by all Kitetsu blades and there's nothing he can do to change it. He has no other choice but to give up on being a bushy. Of course, this is a terrible blow to him because he's dreamed of being a bushy ever since he can remember. Kojiro and Sugumi try to comfort him when suddenly, a huge bull-like Oni lands between them. Alarms go off to signal the arrival of a Kishin at the summit who is sending lesser Oni to attack the town. Musashi is filled with a feeling of dread for the first time because he knows he can't do anything to defeat them. Kojiro saves him when he's an inch away from getting killed by using his new Kitetsu blade. With his newfound sense of power, he saves a mother and her child from another Oni, after which they graciously thank him. He's in awe after receiving gratitude for saving people with his sword, something that never happened in Tatsuyama. After the successful extermination of the bull Onis, Musashi watches Kojiro get praise from afar and accepts his fate as a non-bushi. He tells him if Sugumi leave him behind and join the others at the summit to fight the Kishin. Without a word, Kojiro turns away and starts walking and Sugumi hesitantly follows. Once he's alone, the nameless swordman from before, whose name is Shiro Inukai, by the way, appears next to him and says he saw his entire sword trial. He reveals that he too has the same black aura and that Musashi belongs with them. He explains that he can be very powerful and use Katetsu blades if he surrenders himself to the feeling he got during the sword trial and accepts the black stones on his body, followed by a demonstration where he uses his sword to cut a large square in the ground and cuts it into pieces to create a giant pit. He throws a Kitetsu blade at Musashi and tells him to take the sword trial to become a strong Kitetsu blade himself. 
Confused, Musashi states he doesn't want to become a sword because he wants to fight with his friends. This is a conundrum indeed, and the man suggests his friends also be turned into swords so they can defeat Oni together. Musashi rejects this brilliant idea for some reason, so the man pushes him and the Kitetsu blade down the pit. Meanwhile, Kojiro hurriedly rushes up the mountain with Subumi, yelling behind him to chill for a second. She asks him if it was okay to leave Musashi behind when he was so down. He answers that there's nothing they could say to make him feel better, so he decided to march on forward and wait for Musashi to get back on his feet. Sugimi thinks the black aura could mean something different because it's super rare and only heard of in legends. Maybe it's a sign he comes from a legendary family and has some amazing powers. Kojiro explains that his parents were ordinary farmers, while he was the last bushy kid in town and lived with his father in isolation to avoid being harassed by the locals. He spent most of his childhood alone until Musashi, who was always a weirdo, found him and asked to learn swordsmanship despite it being taboo in the rest of town. His parents were good people who didn't fall for society's prejudices and openly accepted Kojiro and his father, so it was a shame when they both fell sick and died. If not for his parents, Stugumi wonders what it is that makes the Kitetsu Blades reject Musashi. Back at the pit, the woman from before named Nano Inusaka returns and asks what happened to Musashi. After learning he was thrown into the pit, she guesses Shiro sold him some sweet lies to get close to him until confirming that the obsidian goddess he's been looking for is inside him, after which he pushed him into the pit. She feels sad for him because she knows a terrible decision awaits him. Musashi, who has been falling for a while, finally stops his descent by grabbing the Kitetsu blade thrown after him. Immediately after making contact, black stones erupt from his body, and he has to either choose between falling into red-hot magma below him or giving up his consciousness to become a black stone. Musashi looks past the pain and uses the stones to climb up the wall, but a female voice says she won't allow him to do so. More stones erupt from his body, forcing him to fall into the magma. He finds himself in an unknown space with the obsidian goddess, who tells him to stay with her forever. He refuses because he wants to fight with his friends, so she turns back into the demonic form and tells him they don't need him. She forces him to have a flashback to when his parents died, along with many others, in an epidemic. The locals blame his parents for the tragedy because of their lack of faith in the Oni and for showing the bushy people compassion. Nobody was ready to take him in after he was orphaned until a family agreed to raise him on the condition that he didn't do anything to draw attention to himself because they didn't want to be known as helpers of the Son of Blasphemers. He did as he was told until one day, when one of the men in the family forgot to carry his lunch to work, so he left the house to give it to him in public. The family was shamed for taking him in, so they stopped acknowledging his existence altogether. He was so desperate for affection and to be of use to people that when a person told him to throw a rock at Kojiro's father in the street, to prove he isn't like his parents, he threw it, and said that all the remaining bushy should die. The goddess tells him that he's always wanted to feel useful, which is why he does what he does, and that he only wants to be a bushy as a means to be useful and appreciated by his friend. There is no way a person like that can ever wield a Kitetsu blade. Black rocks start growing over his body as she tells him they have the same soul, and she's at risk of being captured if he goes out to fight without having the abilities, so they should just be here together in this closed space forever. While his body gets completely enclosed in rock, Kojiro and Sugumi reach the Kishin at the summit. They're baffled to see the Kishin has no head and wonder if it's dead, but Sugumi points out that it should have turned into Kitetsu if it was. Kojiro knows Musashi will be back to help him at some point, so he decides to look for its weak point for the time being. However, none of the bushes is able to find its horn, so he guesses that it might be in its missing head. Shiro appears on top of the Kishin and announces that his hunch is right because he's the one who hit it. He is surrounded by men from a bushy band, but he kills them by just raising his sword and casually states that he's come to take all their Kitetsu blades so he's going to kill everyone. The bushy men are no pushovers, so they try to take him down, but he pulls an Uno reverse on them. He hears Kojiro's name and goes after him, saying how glorious a bushy's death is because their soul dwells inside their blade and that Musashi is already a Kitetsu blade. Speaking of, the obsidian goddess is satisfied that Musashi has completely turned into black stone because it means she doesn't have to worry about their safety anymore. However, she sees a green light in the distance and feels dejected to know that even hiding his body under magma wasn't enough. Musashi gets fish out of the magma pit by Nanao, who expected him to have already completely turned into black stone. Musashi thanks her and runs off to help his friends at the summit. He knows that the obsidian goddess was wrong about why he wants to be a bushy. A continuation of the flashback shows that he went over to Kojiro's place later that day to apologize to his father for saying such a cruel thing. His father understood the tough position he was in and had already forgiven him. He told him how he'd saved both him and his son by showing compassion to them when no one else did, 
so no matter what, he wanted him to live a long and happy life. After that, he took Musashi in and raised him like his own. He learned from his new father figure that being a bushi means swearing loyalty to everything you cherish and never turning back on it. Kojiro realizes Shiro is after him specifically so he faces him head on but easily gets defeated and almost gets killed when Shiro senses the arrival of Musashi and stops. Kojiro and Sugumi are glad to see him again and ask if he can wield a Kitetsu blade now since he's holding one. Musashi answers that he doesn't glow like the other bushes but the black stone has stopped erupting from his body, so that must mean progress, right? Nanao arrives at the scene and apologizes to Master Shiro for taking him out before he completely turned into stone and will try to kill him as compensation. She takes apart her blade to make seven blades that attack them like murder wheels. Musashi tries to dodge them all and attack her directly but gets repelled by some force field. He realizes they probably have to defeat all her seven blades before they can reach her, so Kojiro comes up with a plan. In an unexpected move, Musashi and Subumi run in different directions while Kojiro stands in front of Nanao. Since her real target is Musashi, she sends all her seven blades toward him, but they get caught by Tsubuma's whips according to plan. While her blades are stuck, Musashi slashes apart one of them. She considers this nothing but a scratch because she still has six blades, but Shiro enters the arena. She tries to tell him that they don't need to fight together yet because she can still handle them, but he condescendingly tells her that they're not going to fight together because he doesn't need her weak ass to help. With one swing of his sword, he flips the mountain upside down causing most of the bushy men to fall to their deaths, while Musashi, Kojiro, and Subhui just barely hang on by their swords. Shiro carves out parts of the mountain to make the bushy men who held on fall while looking down on bushy bands as a bunch of weak insects that swarm together to try and beat Oni. He believes the right way to go about defeating Oni is to become the strongest bushy with the strongest Ketetsu blade. He slams the ground with his sword, sending a shockwave that forces everyone to fall. Musashi thinks it's over for him, but the obsidian goddess appears and uses the last of her strength to stop time and save him because if he were to die, Shiro will capture her and use her for her powers. However, he rejects her attempt at rescue because he knows he can't live without others by his side. The goddess appreciates his ability to make allies to fight for his cause, a valuable trait essential for humans to prevail victorious over the strong Oni. So she entrusts him with her power and resumes time. Large black stones appear on the mountain, which calls upon the energy of all Kitetsu blades like a magnet. Shiro loses his sword too, which is caught by Musashi, who now has long black hair after fusing with a goddess. Capturing his sword undoes the mountain flipping technique, returning the bushi to safety. Next, the goddess wields the Kitetsu blade with his body as a vessel. Nano tries to attack, but she deflects all of her blade's energy, explaining that the power of the black stone is to control blade energy by either repelling or attracting it like a powerful magnet. However, people with this ability are unable to use Katetsu blades because they get confused over the vortex of magnetism. Kojiro realizes that this ability would make Musashi invincible, but she points out that it's only temporary because her existence is fragile in this form and she loses power rapidly in this world. When she inevitably will need to go back to sleep, he will need the help of his friends to defeat Shiro and Nano. Hearing this, Kojiro promises never to let Musashi die. In the very limited time she has left, she draws upon the energy of all the blades in the vicinity to inflict an attack on Cheryl and Nano that demonstrates the power of unified strength. Inside their shared consciousness, the goddess tells Musashi that she will be fighting for the last time in the immortal world before falling asleep, and that it's a shame that Kojiro's father, Jizei, died before finishing what they started. After saying that, she unleashes a powerful attack to drive Cheryl and Nano away. Musashi returns to his normal self, and Kojiro and Subumi run up to hug him. Asafune and her fellow band members thank him for saving their life and offer to give him a better Kitetsu blade to replace the one he broke because of absorbing too much blade energy. The other bushi notice a large pit where the decapitated Kishin was supposed to be and wonder where it went. Elsewhere, Shiro and Nano manage to escape with the captured Kishin thanks to his carving technique. Despite losing, he is glad to have finally found the obsidian goddess and is sure he'll capture her next time. The next day, Musashi re-tempts the sword trial in front of an audience with the same blade he failed with the last time. However, Kojiro and Sogumi believe the black stone won't appear now because the goddess is asleep. He takes a deep breath and grabs the sword. Instantly, a bright red glow surrounds him, and he passes the trial gloriously. Everybody congratulates him for having a red glow because it's the rarest of the five colors. After the test, he takes Kojiro aside and asks him if his father ever mentioned anything about the obsidian goddess because she mentioned him as if she knew him. Kojiro says he has no clue because he only left his katana scroll and Kitetsuki mount behind. 
That makes Musashi wonder where Jizai got a Kiketsuki since nobody else in the village had it. Maybe he had some connections outside Tatsuyama. The Bushi camp disbands later that day, but Musashi and Sugumi can't get a move on because Kojiro has gone off somewhere for some time. He returns and explains that he'd gone to get them some supplies and a map of Hinamoto. He seems to possess a newfound motivation to explore the bushy world that his father had talked about for so long and decides it's best a head east. In the middle of their eastbound journey, Musashi saves Princess Mikiru Saruwateri, daughter of the head of the Saruwateri band, from getting killed by an oni. She is on the way to join the Yuseji Alliance for a battle in Harima Port that will decide the fate of the nation. As a gesture of gratitude, she gives them a ride. They inspect the map to see a black area in their intended direction and wonder what it is. Mikiru suggests they join her and go south because the black area is an unimaginably giant called the Black Kishin, believed to be the first Oni that appeared in Hinomoto. She explains that the humans had no means to defeat it when it first arrived. Humanity split into two groups, the Bushi, who swore to defeat the Oni, and the others, who decided to worship them as gods. As the latter fed the Kishin more and more ore, it grew so large that it covers half the continent. Mikiru's father leads one of the strongest bushy bands and is one of the five generals dedicating his life to defeat the Black Kishin. After that, the princess leaves to continue her journey. Kojiro and Musashi wonder if Juicy knew anything about the Black Kishin and recheck his scroll. Sukumi says everyone who's a part of a bushy band carries these scrolls and identifies the seal to be of the Yusegi Alliance, confirming that Kojiro's father was once a member of the Yusegi band. After learning all this information, Kojiro wishes to know who his father really was and suggests going to Harima Port to try and find out. Both Musashi and Sugumi agree to this change of plans, and they head toward the ocean together in hopes of experiencing new adventures together as the Kanemaki Band. They eventually get to the port in one piece and find the long journey worth it because it's their first time witnessing the jaw-droppingly beautiful expanse that is the ocean. The Yuzuji Band is hard to miss with their huge emblemed flags and giant mobile fortress called the Shiryu Castle hugging the horizon. The trio marches straight to the castle in order to meet with the Yuzuji Lord and inquire about Kojiro's father. However, they are turned away at the gate by Yuzuji First Division member, Now, who says the Lord is too busy preparing for battle to meet every small fry that wants his autograph. He asks them what clan they're from, to which Musashi boldly states they're Kanemaki Band members. The air suddenly turns cold and heavy, as if they shouldn't be here. Nao immediately orders the guards to apprehend them for questioning as they are outsiders, but Musashi starts flailing his arms for a fight. However, his face meets the ground within a second when he's blindsided by an attack from an orange-haired punk with lip piercings. The dude tells Nao that Musashi is clearly weak and not worth worrying about. Before the situation can escalate further, a helicopter with the Yusuji crest lands at the port. Everybody, including Subyumi, bows down expecting the Yuzuji Lord to come out. Musashi and Kojiro wait in anticipation for the man that could have all their answers, but instead, out comes Naotora, Takeda Band's captain. Musashi runs right up to him and greets him like their old pals, but Naotora doesn't even recognize him. Musashi gets super embarrassed after realizing he doesn't remember him, but Naotora quickly breaks the act and starts laughing. Relieved, Musashi calls him a big jerk. This surprises everyone who's kneeling down, including Sogumi, who asks him in a panic how he's being so casual with the captain of the Takeda band and one of the five great generals. Ne remembers it's been a while since he's been an annoying stick in the mud and informs Naotora that the trio must be taken into custody, but Naotora comes in clutch and claims they're his people. After that, he was off to see Uzuvi's leader, refusing to take Musashi and Kojiro along. Later, the Takeda Band Vice Captain Shumrai and senior member Ashi are given babysitting duties over Musashi, Kojiro, and Subyumi. They all take a boat to Shiryu Castle, during which Musashi tries buttering up to them super hard, hoping the Takeda Band will be there in to meet the Uzuji Lord, but Shunrai bluntly tells them that they'll never be allowed to meet him since the Bushi, especially the traditional Uzuji clan, don't treat outsiders kindly, and they don't have anything beneficial to offer in order to be an exception. Seeing Kojiro's disheartened face, Musashi consoles him by saying they'll find out info on his dad by running around during the upcoming Kishin fight. Ashi nips the idea in the bud, explaining the Kishin they're going to face at Awaji Island is called Yamada no Orochi and is on a whole other level compared to the Kishin they fought, so if they gally their limbs, they should stay away. This is because it's one of the four blights, meaning it's basically one of the offspring born from the OG Black Kishin. Defeating it is one more stepping stone toward defeating the Black Kishin, because whatever the Four Blights eat makes the Black Kishin grow bigger. However, this is easier said than done because it's been undefeated for 150 years. 
Once they reach the Shiryu castle, the trio wibbles away from the Shunrai and Ashi in order to gain info on Kojiro's pop. With the help of Subyumi's magic rope, Musashi gains access to the bushy town by bypassing the walls. He takes in the breathtaking scenery while he stands on top of a roof, but he's not alone. A man with a body sculpted like the Greek gods, long silver hair, and a tattoo-filled chest sits beside him. He admires the view as well and tells Musashi he comes up here before every battle to remind himself that every person that risks their life for the clan has a family waiting for them. Soon he gets up, puts a robe on, and ties his hair up. Neo shows up again and frantically tells the man everybody is waiting for his orders. It's only then that Musashi realizes he was talking to Lord Tatsuomi Yuzugi. Neo snaps at him for his rude manners. But Tatsuomi doesn't mind as long as he's an ally bushy. Hoops. As soon as he hears Musashi is one of the outsiders, the Lord turns hostile and orders Neo to take him and his friends to the barracks, a light punishment due to their connection with Naotera Takeda, considering trespassing is usually punishable by death. The trio is escorted to the barracks in chains, where Musashi is separated from the other two and is forced to join another unit. Immediately, he notices the people in the room seem to be divided into factions that don't trust each other yet and are fighting for dominance. They decide to choose the leader among them by determining who the strongest is. From one side of the room, a green-haired nerd named Katsumi Amako comes forward to represent Amako Band as he is the son of the captain. From the other side, the orange-haired punk from earlier walks forward, introducing himself as Akira Shimazu from the Shimazu Band. It doesn't take long for their discussion to turn into name-calling and useless arguments. Musashi is glad to learn Princess Mikiru is also in his unit, but she looks worried for him, because the battle is going to be dangerous. One of her friends expresses distaste for the two guys arguing over leadership, so Musashi puts his hat in the ring as well, hoping he'll open up a path to Lord Tatsuomi again. They decide to settle the matter the traditional bushy way by fighting with the blunt ends of their weapons. Right off the bat, Katsumi and Akira double-team Musashi. Musashi blocks both their attacks at first, feeling pretty good about himself. However, Akira finally draws his Katetsu blade attached to his shoes, pushing Musashi back into a wall. Akihiro then proceeds to propel himself in the air and twist his body around like an upside-down twister, using the momentum and range to strike Musashi with his blades until he can no longer block and gets code. When he regains consciousness, Katsumi is already on his knees but isn't ready to accept defeat yet. Akihiro is about to defeat him for good when Musashi interferes and graciously shakes Akihiro's hand, accepting him as the commander because it will be good to have someone as strong as him leading them. Katsumi begrudgingly forfeits as well and accepts Musashi's help to get back up. Akihiro calls him out for his fakeness, accusing him of only pretending to be friendly because he has an agenda to get a good spot in the unit. He supports this claim by explaining that nobody likes the person that just mopped the floor with them, and that the first thing he did when he walked into the room was examine everybody as if it determining who's worth sucking up to. Katsumi tries to defend him, but Akihiro goes after him too, saying he had already given up on the fight and was glad Musashi gave him a reason to. He must be fun at parties. After that, he decisively becomes the commander of the unit. Later that evening, he addresses his unit with total intimidation, making it clear that insubordination is totally unacceptable. Musashi tries to speak up, pointing out that nobody will be able to be honest if he's so scary, to which Akiro says they don't need to. He continues with his stance, saying that back in his hometown, the Oni were worshipped as gods, and anybody that would dare to oppose their rule was treated like scum. So expecting blind obedience from people isn't right. Akira just calls him a stupid brat in return and dismisses everyone. Nobody has the balls to back Musashi up, and they all scurry away. Fighting tears away, Musashi runs to find Kojiro and Sugui for some affection, but turns away heartbroken after seeing them get along super well with their unit members, having completely forgotten about him. It's okay, Musashi, we all can relate. The next day, Musashi's unit is selected to be part of the first deployment to the island. Akira instructs them that their job is only to pin down the enemies, yielding the killing blows to his band as Shimazu Band. Of course, Musashi just wastes his energy trying to object. He sulks at a corner of the ship, peeling potatoes, where he meets Noguchi, who has a nose that Voldemort would be jealous of. Turns out they're part of the same unit, and according to Noguchi, he and Musashi are two peas in a pod. All Musashi can tell, though, is that he's a bit annoying. Their ship is suddenly under attack by ugly sea unicorn like Lesser Onus. Musashi springs into action to prove himself to everyone and goes straight for its horn. However, his attack bounces right off with zero effect. He gets on top of the horn and keeps trying to slash it, but it stays intact. Another Oni appears behind him, but thankfully he has thick plot armor, so a crimson arrow slices right through them, saving Musashi. 
The arrow turns into our favorite uptight account Nao, who launches a widespread attack that annihilates all the Oni at once, proving his first division rank. Immediately after they are defeated, he turns to his men to shout at them for having imperfect positioning, but one of them shuts him up by reminding him his uptightness is why all seven of his wives left. A second wave of Oni appears, and this time their numbers are in the hundreds. Everybody starts wetting their pants, but Nao uses his Kitetsu blade to form chains and bind a bunch of Oni into a line and destroy their horns. The spectacle brings hope back into everybody's hearts, and Akihiro kills one of the Oni with his Kitetsu blade. Musashi doesn't understand why he can't cut through the Oni horns, to which Noguchi explains that the Oni they're facing have durable horns which can only be destroyed with a blade energy circuit, which channels the energy of many blades. Sure enough, Akihiro channeled his band's blade energies to land that blow. The next Oni he strikes down is with the help of Katsumi and his band who restrain it for him. Seeing all the bushi work together toward the same goal of eliminating Oni makes Musashi realize he was the one being unbushy like all along, only making a fuss so that he can grab all the attention. After they're back on shore, Musashi's self-esteem plummets to the point that he considers running away, but he's approached by Katsumi, who comforts him by saying that it's okay he doesn't know much about Kitetsu Blaze yet, and that the silver lining is that it means he has much more scope to grow in strength as he learns. This rekindles Musashi's spirit and he asks Katsumi why he wants to be unit commander so badly. He answers that Awaji Island is his band's hometown and after the Yamato, no Orochi arrived. They lost everything, so becoming unit commander is his way of gaining control of the situation. His motivation passes on to Musashi and he decides to put his whole heart into this opportunity. The next day, he practices Kaitetsu Blade fighting with Katsumi, whose teaching style seems to be tough love. He coaches him on how to use his blade's energy by attacking him until he gets it. Mikuru watches from above while she battles her own inner demons, which are her daddy issues. She is actually a spy sent by her father to look for the obsidian goddess host and kill them before anyone else gets to them. She's desperate to complete this mission because, without it, she's worthless scum to her father. She only stood out from the dozens of his other kids because she was the only one who could wield a Kitetsu blade and she doesn't want to lose her worth in fear of becoming a forgotten piece of trash again. Since the moment she met Musashi, she knew he's the one she's supposed to kill. However, in a sick joke by fate, she's fallen in love with him because he's the first person to smile at her without expecting anything in return. Due to this, she's been lying to her father that she hasn't found the host yet and intends on stalling as long as nobody else finds out he's the obsidian goddess host. Wasashi calls for Mikuru so he can practice connecting blade energies. She blushes like a schoolgirl at the thought of connecting with him in any way and rushes to help him. At first, everything goes well and he successfully draws on her energy. However, suddenly black crystals jet out of both of them and they form a huge crystal clump that floats in the sky. Mikuru realized that as a consequence of their energies connecting, the black stones within them have resonated and her father is sure to know where they are. She tells Adaze's Musashi that they have to run away. Meanwhile, the bushy on the ground try to break the crystal clump apart, but ordinary blades don't do the trick. The first-class Yusuji tactician, Kuroko Yusami, uses her powerful sword to cast a prison that entraps the crystal. It eventually disappears, returning Musashi and Mikuru to normal. They are immediately surrounded by bushi, including Kuroko and Tatsuomi. Upon her counsel, Tatsuomi labels Musashi as an enemy spy and has him tied basically naked on a cross as a public spectacle. Michiru is determined to save him and uses her black stones to contact her father Yataro, Kuroko, who already suspected Mikiru to be a spy for the black dogs, has been expecting this and intercepts the message to pinpoint the hideout's location to be on the summit of Mountain Yuzuruha on Owaji Island. The reason they let Mikiru run free is so she lead them directly to the black dogs' hideout. Tatsuomi preps his battalions to fight Yamada no Orochi, a challenging foe considering it has a defense system that blocks all Kitetsu blade attacks. He announces that anybody who strikes down one of the Kishin's eight horns will be given an entire fortress. Shimazu Band can't wait to claim their reward, but Nao informs Akihiro his unit won't be joining the battle because two of his troops are under suspicion. And until they're not cleared of suspicion, the unit isn't welcome on the battlefield. Akihiro slips away without a word. Meanwhile, Mikuru breaks into Musashi's cage and frees him. Soon after, Akihiro enters the cage, causing Musashi to be touched that even he cared enough to come and free him. Boy, is he wrong. Akira points his blade at him and straight up threatens him to spill everything to the top brass and clear Shimazu Ban's name. At that moment, a group of Oni ambush them. They're not just ordinary Oni, but can actually talk. They don't beat around the bush and call Mikuru their big sis, saying they come to help her retrieve the obsidian goddess. 
Michiru freezes and is left speechless, causing Musashi to ask her what the meaning of what they're saying. The most talkative out of the Oni, named Minami, answers for her, revealing her goody two-shoes personality was all an act to find the obsidian goddess host and find a way to kill him. Musashi expects her to tell him it's all a lie, but she admits to everything with teary eyes. After that, black crystals erupt from her back and a fat old man's projection appears and tells her to kill him and come home. She explains that the man is her father and she did all this to gain his trust, but she regrets it now. Musashi gets a split-second flashback of the time when everybody in his village forced him to throw a rock at Kojiro's dad. Since she doesn't move, Minami forces her hand, but he grabs her sword and cuts across the Oni's fingers. He grabs Michiru's hand and runs with her, saying there's nothing wrong with wanting her to family to care about her. Minami catches up to them and almost bites a chunk out of him, but Michiru jumps into her jaws, ready to sacrifice herself for him. The three talking Oni start devouring her, but Nao and Kuroko arrive and dismember their limbs. Their parts quickly start regenerating and they demand the Yusugi hand over the obsidian goddess for any hope of mercy. This piques Nao and Kuroko's attention, making them wonder who between Michiru and Musashi is the goddess host. Musashi panics because Michiru is unresponsive and her stones are bleeding. Kuroko uses her blade energy to seal the stone wounds to stop her bleeding and suddenly acts all friendly with him. The Oni, except for the main three, get wiped out. The oldest out of the three, Mishima, happily gives herself up to them, and they eke her out to increase in strength. See, at least they wait for consent. The Bushi are appalled seeing how quickly they turned on someone they called sister, and their so-called father so openly supporting it. Minami and the other name Inawami grow in size, and now they're able to block Neo's attack. Even more Oni flood in and upon Minami's orders, head directly toward the main town inside the castle, while she keeps munching on her own kind to become even stronger. Yataro, the father, orders her and Inawami to devour Makiru, since she's a traitor. Musashi looks pissed, so he explains his ideology as simply being the strongest have the right to monopolize the resources of the weak, pointing out that even the bushy fight in such a way that the ones at the top feed on others' strength. Tatsuomi charges up and bizarrely appears to attack his comrades. Kuroko explains that he is a yellow blade type, which gives him the ability to enhance the physical traits of his allies, including their gear. Tatsuomi directly addresses Yatero's statement, saying that although he agrees it feels good to derive strength from others, there's also pleasure in sharing it. With their newfound strength, the Yusuji Bushi cut down the Oni one by one, even taking down Inawami. Their most outstanding ability is to create blade energy links with dozens of men when the typical link can't contain more than five, and it's only possible due to the strong unity among the Yusuji band under Tatsuomi's leadership. With the help of the spectacular dragon-shaped energy circuit, Nao lands the finishing blow on Minami and claims Bushi's victory. Still, this is no time to relax because it's weird how the Oni were able to infiltrate the castle, because it's usually protected by a barrier, so Nao orders a sweep of the entire place to find out why. However, it's unnecessary because the answer presents itself. Shiro proudly takes credit for the feat and shows Tatsuomi's sword, claiming he's taken her leader's soul. The Yuzugi immediately restrain him with ropes and form a blade energy circuit with Neo at the helm, but it breaks before he can strike. He looks back to see his men have somehow been infected, which forcibly cut the connection. At that moment, Shiro's ally Seroku teleports into the scene to help him wipe out the Yuzugi band. They try linking up again, but turns out Seroku's signature move is to sever energy circuits. Shiro spots Musashi in the crowd and immediately gets in his face, saying how he'll make him his special sword one day. He then notices something about Mikiru also reminds him of the obsidian goddess, but he dismisses it for now and cuts a square around Musashi and makes him disappear. Turns out his little trick exchanged the places between Musashi and one of the heads of Yamada no Orochi, which destroys part of the town with just one attack. Musashi finds himself the heart of Awaji Island, where he's confronted by Mikiru's father Yataro who asks him to step aside so he can dispose of Mikiru. Of course he doesn't budge, so he decides to cut him down and get the obsidian goddess first. However, Mikiru wakes up and begs him to spare Musashi. She tries to convince him she's not broken or defective and can still think clearly. Despite this, she doesn't want to go through with killing him because she doesn't want to lose the warmth she gets from talking and laughing with him, but she also doesn't want to disappoint her father even though he's never shown her any kindness. Itaro asks her if she has any way to accomplish both, to which she says she believes they can retrieve the obsidian goddess without killing Musashi, and she's willing to do the research to find out how. He walks toward her, saying he's glad she's inherited his passion for study, and feels she's his blood for the first time and hugs her. Suddenly, he draws out his sword, but Musashi pushes him back. He says goodbye to her and turns her into black stone. 
He explains to Scream and Musashi that he hasn't killed her, only turned her into her true form. He reveals that heat implants Katetsu fragments in the wombs of select children to form Oni hybrids, of which the Orochi ones like Minami were particularly successful. Meichiru was a failure because she was no stronger than a human. Musashi appeals to him by pointing out that he would have killed her if he wanted to get rid of her, so Yatara returns her to her human form. Musashi excitedly welcomes her back, but she has no idea who she is. Yataro explains he erased all her memories because the only use he has of her is her ability to wield a Ketetsu blade, so now she can be an unquestioning doll who will listen to her parent no matter what. This doesn't fly with Musashi, and he immediately goes on the attack but isn't able to draw out Ketetsu blade energy because it isn't his sword. Mikiru cheers her father on as he throws Musashi around. He's about to land a fatal blow when Mikiru appears behind him and stabs him with black crystals projecting from her body. Realizing there are still remnants of her memories inside her, he tosses her aside and vows to erase her memory again and again until she learns to be his blank slate daughter for good. Musashi can't do anything more as he's teleported away from the scene. Meanwhile, Yamada no Orochi goes on its castle-destroying rampage while Shiro takes a back seat to relax. Seroku takes on Nao, attacking him with barbed rope that lacerates his skin. Suddenly, hundreds of Takeda band Ketetsuki mounts show up as reinforcements. Now Avtora looks for Tatsuomi, so Shiro spares him his energy by revealing he took him. They immediately lock Katetsu blades, but the black dog's time runs out, and they make their exit. Nao enlists the help of Musashi and the obsidian goddess inside of him to defeat the Kishin. He agrees and is joined by Kojiro and Sugumi. Yeti Oji Trio is back. Sugumi unveils the fabric she's been carrying around to reveal Musashi's Katetsu blade underneath. Kojiro explains they stole it from the execution grounds with the intention of helping him escape and running away together before the Uzuji killed him for being a spy. When Musashi asks why they go to such lengths, they answer it's because he's their friend. Neva says he's lucky to have good friends and that he really needs to save his own. Finally, Neo leads them to the Uzuji mausoleum, where he tells them that the obsidian goddess was a real woman who had control over all blade energy and bestowed the first Kitetsu blade onto humanity. After she passed, her soul still remained, and it is said that whoever possesses her spirit also has her powers sleeping within them. Hence, Musashi should have the unique ability to control all Kitetsu blades and unite all Bushi and Hinomoto. Musashi points out that the last time he saw her, she said she was going into a slumber, and he wouldn't have her problems anymore. Lucky for him, Nao has a chest that contains a treasure meant to unlock the goddess power. Perfect. He will give it to Musashi if he agrees to use his power to defeat Yamato no Orochi, because he believes the Black Dogs have captured Tatsuomi. Musashi asks who exactly the Black Dogs are, to which he answers that they call themselves the Obsidian Eight, and are Ketetsu Blade wielders who side with the Oni alone and are responsible for hundreds of bushy deaths. Nao opens the chest to reveal an urn full of the Obsidian Goddess blood, which he tells Musashi to drink to awaken her powers. He doesn't really want to because he's not a squalower, but Nao forces it down his throat. After that, Musashi doesn't feel any different, so they just leave. Mr. Shi returns to his unit to find all the Sarawateri members from Michiru's kingdom have gone missing, and the Shimazu band members absent because they were ordered to stay back. He gives the remaining members a standard pep talk to motivate them to work together, when Kuroko appears and tells them she has a task for them. The Yuzugi makes its first move against the Kishin with the 5,000-membered, white-clad first deployment in accordance with tactician Kuroko's plan. As soon as Yamada no Orochi detects enemies, it starts firing on them, so instead of attacking directly, she has them spread oil in the water with the help of abandoned ships, which archers set fire to with blazing arrows. The Kishin's heads instinctually focus on attacking the fire, and while it's distracted, Musashi's unit and hundred other troops march for its feeding supplies at your mine under the cover of smoke. However, they run into an oni that Seroku planted there because he heard Kuroko's plan through his spy. The situation seems doomed until Akihiro and the rest of the Shimazu band shows up and totally annihilate the Oni. With their help, they make it to the Yura mine where their target is. At the same time, the Black Dogs get reports of the second deployment coming in consisting of the Takeda band. This is a complete shock to them because their spy had let them listen in on a meeting where Naotoro refused to send his band to the battle. But it turns out that was all a sham orchestrated by Kuroko to mislead spies. Musashi's unit is about to set fire to the explosives they planted on the oars of Yura Mine, but they're confronted by Shiro, who uses his dimensional magic to transport the explosives onto the Takeda Band's ships. It seems a total checkmate for the Uzuji Band, and Seroku shows himself to Kuroko through his spy, revealing he outsmarted her at every turn because he knew all her plans. He speaks too early, though, because one of his men reports now Tora is still alive and kicking ass. 
Kuroko reveals she won this battle by feeding false information to his minions, saying it was easy to single them out because they're the only ones who stepped on their band's crest without pause. Seroku is completely taken aback but still thinks he can't be beaten, because nobody in Misugi is strong enough. Neo suddenly jumps down from his hiding spot to fight him with the intention of undoing the energy blocking. He remembers Tatsusomi telling him he is the strongest bushi in the Yuzuji band and it'll be his job to protect its people if he's not around. Those words empower him to grab Seroku's sword and break it in half, causing the infection spell that's blocking the blade energy circuit to break. As soon as the black-clad soldiers are free, Kuroko sends 2,500 of them to shatter Yamada no Orochi's horns. The fight isn't over though because Seroku takes out yet another sword. Meanwhile, now Tora shows up at the Yura mine because he's the only one strong enough to face Shiro. He tells Musashi that if the Yusubi hope to shatter the Kishin's horns, they must defeat the Black Dogs, which is why he's going to deal with Shiro, while Neo takes care of Seroku, leaving Yataro to Musashi. Neo seems to push him back well, thanks to his undeniable advantage in strength. However, Seroku turns the tide again by using his special yellow blade technique in which he uses his strings to inflict different forms of injury. Neo gets tangled up in them, leading to lacerations on his legs. Once he's on the ground, Seroku blinds him, causing him to lose all his bearings. Instead of killing him off quickly, Seroku takes his sweet time by torturing him with burning, joint dislocation, and fractures, all while rambling complex medical terms. He even breaks his thumb and pinky finger so he can no longer hold his sword. He lifts the blinding spell from Mayo's eyes once the Yusuji ships are near the shore, so that he can see his comrades being defeated. He starts telling Neo he used to want to save his comrades as well, and he became a doctor for it. However, he was taken advantage of by his so-called muscle-head comrades for his magic, always given the hardest responsibilities with nothing in return. He assumes Neo's comrades are just like that. Wordlessly, Neo takes off the bandage covering his forehead and ties his right hand to his sword. He uses another bandage to grasp Seroku's sword like an anchor and lifts himself up. Then he turns his sword against himself, using his own blade energy to sever the strings made of yellow blade energy around him. It works, and the strings snap, causing the effects to reverse and allowing him to use his limbs again. The strings bounce back and try to track him again. But he goes directly to Seroku to kill him before they can mutilate him again. However, Seroku turns out to be an excellent swordsman with unbelievable speed, landing enough wounds on Neo that he loses a lot of blood. He's about to slash him down for good when two Dusuji Bushi run in front of him to protect him. Seroku continues with his swing, ready to kill them all at once. But instead, Neo comes back ahead and uses his hand to take the blow, and while Seroku's stuck there, he stabs him cleanly through the chest. Meanwhile, now Tora has his vice captain Shunrei create a green energy barrier around him and Shiro to contain the fight within it. Shiro unleashes his peculiar grayish blade ring in a hurry to get this over with so he can meet the obsidian goddess. Now Hatora thinks the blade ring looks familiar to something he saw 10 years ago and asks if they've ever met. Shiro doesn't remember and doesn't care to jog his memory, again mentioning he needs to get to the goddess. Now Hatora wonders why he's so obsessed with her to the point that he and the other black dogs destroy whole bushy bands, saying that since she's the only source of inter-bushy conflict, it's better if she just dies for good. This ticks off Shiro really badly, so he breaks the barrier around them and uses his void power to create a cube of deep ocean waters over Takeda Band. The pressure alone should be enough to kill Naotora and the rest off-screen, but eventually, the queue splits apart by Naotora's powerful slash, revealing he and his band are completely fine, if not a little wet. The two begin fighting and Naotora uses a powerful attack at Shiro, but he merely deflects it back with his cut and pays dimensional powers. Shiro's fighting style and aura are so unique that Naotora asks what color his blade energy is, to which Shiro reveals he is a white-bladed bushy the rarest and most powerful type. Shiro notes now Tora is a blue type which is considered the most common and weakest because it doesn't have the brute strength of red, nor the special powers of yellow and green. Shiro has the upper hand at first and he creates another cube in the air which turns into molten lava. The lava slowly flows down toward now Tora, but somehow a huge wave of water floods in and cools the lava into solidified rock. Ashi calls out to a surprised Shiro and tells him not to underestimate blue-bladed Bushi. He tells him that back when they took their sword trials and learned their blue types, now Tora told them not to be sad, because blue types are especially attuned to the soul of stone, much like the Kishin who use their ability to manipulate minerals and ores to control the forces of water and fire. Yes, blue-bladed Bushi have the power to control elements just like the Kishin. Now Tora reappears, this time with fire and water tigers he created, but Shiro easily defeats them, scoffing that the apex of blue-bladed abilities is underwhelming. He shifts them both into another dimension so they can fight without interruptions. 
However, before the dimensional box closes, Naotora sucks in as much fire and water as he can. Once they're alone, Shiro asks why Naotora even bothered to control fire and water because they wouldn't help shatter Kishin's horns, to which Naotora confirms he's right and that he developed this technique especially for the Obsidian 8, after he saw a battlefield full of his dead comrades and that sinister grey blade ring in the sky ten years ago. He gathers all the fire and water to form a tiny compact black sphere on his palm, which he then turns into a small blade. Shiro finds it interesting, but before he can even complete his sentence, Naotora walks past him and says he's already done it. Shiro grasps his chest in confusion and jagged stones erupt from him suddenly. Naotora returns to Awaji Island, where his comrades eagerly wait for him. He announces he destroyed Shiro's Kitetsu blade so that he can no longer take part in this battle. The Takeda band joyfully celebrates their leader's victory and sends out the signal to Kuroko. Now that two black dogs have been defeated, all that's remaining is defeating Yataro while the black-clad elite bushy-faced Yamada no Orochi and the white-clad rescue Tatsuomi. Musashi is escorted to the base of Yuzuruha Mountain by his unit. However, Akira doesn't bother with giving instructions to the unit, only relying on his five Shimazu band members to do the job. This forces Katsu to step in and coordinate the others into action, demonstrating the power of the Amako band for the first time. Once they reach the base of the mountain, Akira bluntly tells them that the Shimazu band doesn't care about the enemy Bushin inside. Rather, they have their eyes set on defeating the Kishin that'll come afterward. Katsumi is pretty disappointed that all they care about is the glory that comes with shattering a Kishin horn, but the Shimazu are at detriment about making a name for themselves. They tell the others, especially Musashi, not to get in the way because he just learned how to use blade energies. Surprisingly, Musashi agrees and says he hopes that one day he can fight with his comrades as amazingly as the Shimazu band does. Musashi, along with the other hundred troops, walks deeper into the hideout, where they eventually run into Yataro. He stares at them in defiance, saying he's finally completed his plan and is now one with the Kishin after sacrificing his daughters. After that, he transforms into a giant monster. He transforms some of his daughters into blades which wipe out most of the troops, leaving Musashi's unit and the Shimazu band. Shimazu Band immediately engages in combat, seeing that Yataro has now become a Kishin. They try to go up to the horn while forming a blade energy chain, but the daughter blades get in the way, causing the link to fail again and again. One of the Shimazu Bushi finds himself face to face with a blade, but Musashi arrives in the nick of time to break it. Without a word of gratitude, he goes back up to join the band. The daughter blades form so many beams in between the Shimazu Bushi that there's no path left for them to form an energy circuit. Suddenly, the beams start disappearing one by one, and they realize Musashi is the one taking them down. The Shimazu band slowly starts building up its chain as Musashi gives his all to destroy any barriers that show up, even saving one of the Shimazu who got surrounded by the blades. Finally, the link is completed and Akihiro shatters Yutero's horn, causing the daughter blades to disappear all at once and marking the end of the fight. Katsubi notices that there's no Kitetsu dust to collect. Suddenly, the Kishin's corpse turns into a white serpent, and it slithers out of the mountain and toward Yamato no Orochi, staying all the ore from the rocks to feed the big boss Kishin. If it were to succeed, Yamato no Orochi would gain the strength to demolish the Yuasugi and Takeda bands all at once. Musashi tries to motivate everyone to work together, and surprisingly the Shimazu band agrees with him this time, but Akihiro is stubbornly silent the entire time. They plan to form an eight-link chain with the addition of Katsumi and Musashi, relying on his red blade energy to boost their circuit's strength. Musashi asks what's up with Akira, to which the rest of the Shimazu say they should just forget about him. Akira finally opens his mouth to say he can't stand that everyone's laughing when their comrades are out dealing with a threat, to which the eldest of the Shimazu members says he has no right to suddenly talk about caring for his comrades because he did nothing to protect the member who almost died by the daughter blades almost moments ago. He exposes Akira as being a power-hungry monster who's only after becoming the band's head by using his members as sacrificial pawns. Akira openly admits to this accusation, after which the Shimazu band decides to work without him. He takes out a wooden block from his pocket and throws it in frustration. Musashi picks it up and asks one of the Shimazu members what it is, to which he answers they're all brothers who got along well before, and they use those blocks to plan imaginary Kishin battles together. Once they see the serpent's horn, they start forming the energy chain and try to break it, but their blades don't form a scratch. They ask Musashi to replace Akira's spot because they need a red blade's explosive power to land the finishing blow. They form the link again and throw the energy toward him, but Akihiro shows up and tries to steal the energy. He has a flashback to when they were planning one of their battles. 
He was always the one who wanted to be the second in the energy circuit, giving the glory to the oldest brother because his shy personality made him not want to stand out. He tells Musashi that they've all got it wrong and that he doesn't want to play the role of smashing the horn. Then he steals the energy link again and strikes one of the serpent's horns, causing it to shatter. The Shimazu brothers wonder why Akira has become so greedy for recognition and power because he was the polar opposite before. The oldest brother pinpoints this change as having occurred after the sword trial when all the brothers turned out to be blue-bladed except for Akira, who was revealed to have a red soul. After that, their father denounced the older brother as his hair and gave it to Akira. He tried to turn it down, arguing that the oldest brother was best at combat, but after unintentionally defeating him in a Kitetsu blade fight in front of the entire clan, there was no arguing who the new leader should be. Since then, there was a divide between him and the older brother, who was jealous of his powers. Now, Akihiro comes up to the squad and says they will form a blade energy circuit with the entire unit, which is a tall order because unity is needed to form them. He clarifies he wants them standing in place and linking at close range, making it clear to the Shimazu brothers more than ever that he only thinks of them as a means to gain strength. Left with no other choice, the unit does as he says, and he smashes another horn. Akihiro remembers the happy days with his brother before the power dynamics came in, revealing to himself they are the most important to him, and that they should be safe at the distance he's kept them. He's about to chop the top horn off the serpent when suddenly, one of Yamat no Orochi's heads bursts through and bites the serpent, eating Akihiro along with it. However, the energy circuit stays intact, meaning Akihiro must still be alive. Despite the animosity, the Shimazu can't just leave their brother alone and decide to save him, but they're ordered to stay back by the Yusuji black-clad Bushi. Musashi goes up to the oldest brother, Haruhisa, and tells him that he must save his younger brother, but Harisa admits to resenting Akira because he always wanted to be the leader. Musashi shows him the woodblock, making him and the other brothers realize that Akihiro cares enough about them and their past to carry it into battle. Meanwhile, Akihiro stands calmly inside the kitchen's mouth, comfortable with the idea of dying because he made up his mind long ago that he'd die so that Harisa would be made the hare and all his brothers would be happy. He is knocked out by one of the kitchen's teeth and gets another flashback of his brothers. He reopens his eyes and sees Haruhisa in front of him, who tosses the wood block back to him. Haruhisa asks why he doesn't look happy, to which he said, he wanted to make sure all his comrades were safe while he fulfilled his duty of breaking the kitchen's horn. But now he's come inside its mouth and not only endangered his life, but also broken the energy circuit they need to defeat the kitchen. This makes Haruhisa realize his young bro Ake Hero always cared for him. So he says they just have to make it again. Suddenly, everyone appears inside the mouth and all the brothers hug it out and forgive Akihiro. They form the energy circuit again, and this time, Akihiro shatters the serpent's apex horn, destroying the Yamada no Orochi's source of nourishment. With that threat out of the way, the Yushi and Takeda forces merge and destroy all the Yamada no Orochi's horns in one fell swoop. All at once, the Kishin disappears, clearing the sky for the first time in 150 years and releasing an unbelievable amount of Kaitetsu dust. The Bushi lift their blades up but soon notice the dust isn't collecting on the swords but rather is going toward the top of the mountain. Suddenly, tremors rumble all over the island, and stones erupt from the base of the mountain. Musashi realizes Kojiro and Subyumi might be in danger because they're still in the midst of looking for and rescuing Lord Tatsuomi, so he frantically starts running up the mountain. Suddenly, he's struck by the same odd feeling he felt when he connected with Michiru's blade energy. However, the dust clears and he finds Kojiro and Subui holding up Tatsuomi who's missing an arm. They all have a short happy reunion, after which Tatsuomi tells Musashi that Mikuru was with him when he was held captive, and all she would talk about is how she's in love with Musashi even though she can't remember him, and she's worthless trash because her dad says so. Hearing this, Musashi runs further ahead, desperate not to abandon her. They eventually reach a canyon where the rest of the mountain should be. At the bottom, a black sword and warrior appear. He reveals himself to be Yataro, who's turned himself into a Kishin, and successfully turned Mikuru into a Kitetsu blade after decades of experimenting on his daughters. Tatsuomi orders all the Bushi to get ready to fight, but Yataro swings his great sword 360 degrees, destroying chunks of the mountain around him along with the attacking Bushi. While Yataro does an evil laugh, Musashi strikes him from above, but he blocks it and Musashi feels his blade energy draining from him. Yataro explains his sword is just like the goddess and can control blade energy. After that, he steals the blade energy of all the bushi on the island and unleashes apocalypse-level attacks. Musashi fights back and tries to reach Mikuru, causing her to go into an identity crisis. She resists her memories of Musashi, but they trickle in, causing the sword to start crying. Yataro gets frustrated and attacks Musashi, but Takeda protects him. 
Tatsuomi uses his Yellow Blade powers to enhance Takeda and Mayo's strength, but they soon get defeated by Yataro. Tatsuomi orders the rest to retreat while protecting Musashi, who has the Obsidian Goddess. Yataro has no intention of letting anyone escape and swings his sword at Musashi again while Kojiro tries to take the blow. Suddenly, everything around Musashi freezes and a portal opens up, inside of which a child Mikiru sits alone and afraid. Musashi enters and sees her memories of when she was born. Her father looked happy for a second, but then tossed her aside the next second after realizing she didn't have the powers of the Obsidian Goddess. Mikiru thanks him for making her realize there's happiness in this world and making the coldness in her turn into warmth. She wishes she could be with him for longer, to which he says she can as long as she comes with him and joins his band after this is all over. She happily holds his hand, causing all her memories to come back for good and time to resume. She explains she can only return to her human form if he destroys the black stone inside her father, which turned her into a sword. She points toward five doors of different colors, explaining that obsidian is made from the combination of all those colors, and since he drinks fifth of the obsidian goddess blood, he should be able to awaken and master one of her powers. Musashi returns to the real world with long golden hair. He starts absorbing everybody's blade energy like Obsidian Goddess did before, but Yeptaro tries to gain dominance over the energies. The two titans clash with their swords, but Musashi's dominant arm gets chopped off. Without wasting a breath, he stops Yeptaro's next swing with his other hand's index finger by concentrating everyone's blade energy into it. He punches the shit out of Yeptaro until the black stone inside him comes out. He's about to smash it to free Mikuru, but she stops him last second and asks to talk to her father one last time. They return to her dimension where Yataro asks Mikuru if she's choosing Musashi over him and abandoning their common dream of becoming a superior being. She explains her dream was never that but to just be happy and hold her father's hand. He ignores her and tries to manipulate her one last time, so she steps away and tells Musashi to destroy the stone. Upset, she'll never be able to reach him. She sadly tells him that after he destroys it, Mikuru's body will also likely disappear because she was born out of it. However, Yataro says that he will be the only one to disappear because half of Michiru's body is human. He does some self-reflection and realizes there's nothing superior about him, and he went most of his life treating his daughters horribly, when he should have sympathized with them, because even he was shunned as a child for having physical disabilities. After that revelation, he finally recognizes Michiru to be a completely different person from him, and is filled with regret. Michiru is filled with relief and happiness that her father finally saw her for the first time and bids farewell forever. Musashi destroys the stone, ending Yatero's life and finally releasing the Kitetsu dust from his kitchen. Peace is finally restored to Awaji Island. After the Awaji Island liberation mission, Michiru is detained in the castle and not kept in a cell, because Musashi doesn't allow it. There is no information on the remaining black dog's current whereabouts, and Tatsuomi finds it odd that he was captured rather than killed and is convinced that there's more to their plan than meets the eye. Two weeks after the incident, there is an award ceremony to honor the brave bushy warriors that contributed greatly to the liberation, including Musashi and Nao. The Shimazu brothers are awarded a castle, after which they are free to act on their own without taking orders from their shitty father. Both Tatsuomi and Nao Tora invite Musashi into their bands, but he rejects them both, saying he's already part of the Kanemaki band, which is destined to become the strongest someday. Kojiro is finally able to talk to Tatsuomi about the signature on his father's scroll. Tatsuomi personally doesn't know Jizai Kanemaki and recognizes the signature as his father's. There is no record of Jizai in the Yuzuji records, meaning whatever connection their fathers had was temporary. He offers to contact the other five great generals on this matter because Kojiro's father must have been an important person to have the previous Mizuji Lord's signature. When Kojiro asks why he's going to such an extent, he says that it's partly his gratitude for saving him from Awaji Island and partly because Musashi asked him to help in return for a favor. You see, Tatsuomi had summoned Musashi to ask him to drink all of the Obsidian Goddess blood which has been split among the five great bushy bands in order to defeat the Obsidian Eight for good. He agreed to do so on two conditions, the first being to help Kojiro find out about his father and the second being to free Mikuru. Once she's freed, Musashi takes her around the beautiful Shiryu castle, where they have a lot of fun enjoying each other's company. They exchange promise rings, which gives Michiro so much happiness that she wishes she was a normal human who had more time with him, but sadly, her body's been showing cracks in different places. On her last day, they spend the evening looking at the sunset when she thanks Musashi one last time for all he's given her. The cracks start to grow, and Musashi tries to hug her before she disappears with a smile on her face, leaving him alone and depressed. He wonders why Mikuru had to be created only to disappear so quickly. He sees a vision of the obsidian goddess where she tells him that if he wants answers, 
you will have to reach where she is. Hearing this, Musashi swears to do so and destroy the Obsidian 8 and Kishin for good. That's it for this video. Make sure to like and subscribe for more videos, and watch this next video on screen.